day is it, son? What day? Get ready for a game day edition of CBJ and 30. Game on! Yeah, game on! Hear from the players and coaches as the Blue Jackets get set to hit the ice. Join the discussion on Twitter by using the hashtag CBJ and 30. Here's your host, Bob McGilligan. The moon is right. The spirit's up. We're here tonight. be honest that's not one of my favorite christmas songs ever but it fits the bill today simply having a wonderful christmas time how could you not be after what happened last night at nationwide arena happy festivus we'll get to that in a couple of minutes this is cbj in 30 i'm bob mckelligan and it's another game day edition as the blue jackets are coming off a huge seven to one win over the pittsburgh penguins last night but they don't get to dwell on that for very long because tonight the Montreal Canadiens are back at Nationwide Arena, and the Blue Jackets will try to make it 12 straight wins going into the Christmas break. Is it just me, or is this true for you, too? It is kind of surreal today. Just kind of surreal. Did I really see that last night? Did I really witness the Columbus Blue Jackets playing the Pittsburgh Penguins, going down one to nothing, 2 minutes and 39 seconds into the first period, and then scoring 7 Count them, seven straight goals, and just blowing the Penguins out of the building. Did I really see that? Yes, I really did see it. You really did see it, and what a feat it was for the Blue Jackets. And There have been so many times that those two teams have gotten together in this same building, and it's gone the other way. I remember one night right after I started here full-time when the flurry chants were going on because the Penguins were beating up on the Blue Jackets so badly. And there were so many Pittsburgh fans in the building, that's all you heard was their voices and nothing else. Well, last night, the opposite was certainly true, and it was a sight to behold. And again, as I've talked about for weeks on end, it was a different hero. Every day is a different hero. Everybody played a role last night, no doubt about it. I think Brandon Dubinsky played his role perfectly once again, getting under the skin of Sidney Crosby. I thought something was strange right at the beginning of the game. And strange because when Crosby scored his goal, he gave a celebration that I'm not saying he never celebrates, but just the way he did it, I thought, wow, that's uh, that's a little bit, not over the top, but it's a little bit more than I expected out of him this early in the game. So there was obviously uh, something on the Pittsburgh side that they knew coming in that they were going to be in for a game. And to get the early lead was a big deal to their captain, especially the way that he got that early lead for them, knocking the puck out of midair to put it behind Sergei Bobrovsky. But the Blue Jackets, as they have done all year, and they didn't start well, they let the Penguins come at them early on. Uh, John Tortorella said, as only John Tortorella can say, that they were nervous. In fact, his quote was, we were wetting our pants in the first period of the game. That's how nervous he felt that his young team was last night facing the defending Stanley Cup champions. But after that goal, the Blue Jackets started to get their game together. It started to take root once again. And as we have seen, In previous games during this winning streak, when their game comes together, I can't say they're unbeatable because nobody is completely unbeatable, but they are as close as you can possibly get to it. They just start to grind and grind, and the seesaw just started to tilt the other way there. And then all of a sudden it was like uh, you had the biggest kid in the class on the seesaw. It was tilted one way, and it wasn't going the other way at all. That's what the Blue Jackets did to the Pittsburgh Penguins last night. Uh, The second goal, looking back on it now, I thought, uh, or I think now, was so key just because it was two things, and I mentioned this at the time. The Blue Jackets are inside of the Penguin zone, and they're getting great pressure, and they're keeping the puck in there. They've got the Penguins hemmed in their own end, and then they make a line change. And I think it was Dubinsky's line that was out when that thing first started. Then the Carlson line came out, and they just continued to put the pressure on and put the pressure on. Maybe it wasn't Dubinsky's line. Maybe it was uh, Sedlak's line because Sam Gagne was on the ice. Gagne goes behind the net. This guy continues to impress. He goes behind the net. He's getting tackled to the ice, and he just simply 
flips the puck out in front, and William Carlson is standing there, takes it off the backhand, roofs the top shelf, and it's a 2-1 to one lead. Nobody knew it. Well, the players knew it. The players always know when they score, but nobody in the building knew it. The referee didn't signal a goal, and play continued. And then all of a sudden, the horn went off, and then the cannon went off right in the middle of play, which I think is kind of a no-no, and you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to wait for the referee signal, and then you once, you know, if, if there's a whistle, then they go back and they right they're wrong but it doesn't matter because the game operations staff was right it was a goal they went back they reviewed it they looked at it and found out that indeed the puck went in the net and uh so it was counted and it was a two-to-one game and the route was on at that point nobody knew it nobody knew it but the route was really on at that point then Scott Hartnell beating Derek Pouliot to a loose puck. And I was shocked by this. I was really shocked by this. Now, some of the Pittsburgh people that I talked to, some of those people were not as shocked as I was. But Derek Pouliot's a young defenseman. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, they were touting this guy like he was going to be another uh, Chris Letang. Not to that level, but he was going to be just below a Chris Letang and be a big defenseman for them. Not, not big in size, but an important defenseman for them. And all of a sudden, this guy can't get out of the minors half the time, then he's here, and he gets beaten to a loose puck by Scott Hartnell. And I'm not taking anything away from Scott Hartnell, but I thought young defenseman is going to bust his tail through the neutral zone knowing that if Hartnell gets that puck, there's trouble on the horizon. But he didn't get to it. And Hartnell just gliding through there, accelerates, gets the puck, which, by the way, had turned up on end and started rolling toward the net. This is the second time that's happened in about a week or so. Remember Sam Gagne had an empty net goal a couple of games ago where the puck was going wide and it got up on end and it started to break hard to the left and it just went into the net? A lot of times when that puck gets on end, it rolls the other way. It goes the opposite way. But last night, it went in the Blue Jackets' favor again. So it's rolling on end. It's rolling right toward the net. Hartnell just has to pick it up. All he does, flatten it out, makes a move, gets Matt Murray to go down, tucks the puck around him, and the Blue Jackets lead 3-1. to one. But they weren't even close to being done because that was only through two periods. And this is a team that prides itself in being a third-period team. And, boy, did they come out and establish themselves on home ice in the third period. You can't do it any more quickly than they did. Before you knew it, bang, 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 three goals are in the back of the net. And it goes from 3-1 to one to 6-1. to one. And Hartnell had one of those goals, so now he's sitting on two for the night. Matt Murray is gone. The guy that won the Stanley Cup in goal for the Pittsburgh Penguins is now out of the game, and Marc-Andre Fleury has to come in. From the moment Fleury comes in, he's being razzed by the fans. They're all over him, and he hardly has time to get himself warmed up before Scott Hartnell tucks a puck behind him and winds up getting a hat trick. And the hats come raining down, and the cheers, and then the taunts on Flurry, And it was just, uh, it, it was an incredible scene. It was an incredible night. And it's too bad that wasn't the last game before the Christmas break, and we have to go right back at it again tonight. Not saying that I don't think the Blue Jackets can do it again, because I fully believe. How could you not believe in this team at this moment, right? I, I fully believe they can. But it, it was just, it was such a great night. Such a great night. And again, I understand it was game number 31. And I know what Torts is going to say later today. You know, that was just one game. This is another game. I understand all that. I get it. But, man, it sure was big. It sure was big. And you know the Blue Jackets as a team. They feel great about that win that they got last night. Nick Felino said before the game to me, this is a measuring stick. We want to see where we are. And that's how you find out. And that's what they've been doing. They've been finding out how they match up against the best competition in the league. And they've been passing the tests. And they passed a big one last night, and they have to pass another big one tonight because the Montreal Canadiens come into this game having lost last night, and they come back to a place where the last time they visited, they got railroaded right out of town. Beaten. And I mean beaten. Ten to nothing. You think they won't have a chip on their shoulder? Yeah, they will. It looks like Al Montoya is going to start in goal again. And I, you know, that's fine with me talk about that here in just a minute because I have somebody that has something to say about that but um, I don't care I don't care who starts in goal I don't care what the Canadians do it doesn't matter much to me whatsoever right now the Blue Jackets are rolling and hopefully that roll continues through tonight and right into the Christmas break well I told you why well, well, I alluded to it I said happy Festivus to you today is Festivus what is Festivus now I'm not going to assume that you automatically know what it is. And I'll tell you why I'm not going to assume that. Last night, I was talking with the super genius, 
Mark Madden. He is a radio show host in Pittsburgh, does an afternoon drive show. He is a huge Penguin supporter. He's a friend of R.J. Umberger's and Brandon Sods, as a matter of fact, and he came to town and uh, had lunch with R.J. the other day and talked with Brandon Sod after the game last night. And, you know, Mark on his radio show, he's a former wrestling guy. He used to do WCW, so he's uh, he's got a shtick. I like his shtick. I like the way he does things, but I can sit down and have hours of conversation with him, He's and he's a very – very knowledgeable hockey guy. But when I was talking to him last night, he was telling me about doing his show and quoting movies and how he's quoting movies to some of these younger hockey players and they have no idea what he's talking about because a lot of, I guess a lot of young people today don't go back and watch the movies that I used to watch. I mean, even movies like Caddyshack, um, they're not getting the quotes out of those movies. So uh, it's a changing of the guard, I guess. And he had a pretty good point. He said, I think that maybe... In the last generation, uh, the guys used to watch the movies with their dads, and maybe now they don't even watch the movies at all. They're into all kind of other things. So that's an interesting theory. I don't know if it's true, but I could see where it would be because I, you know, I will, uh, I'll do that with my boys. Uh, Christmas Vacation is a great uh, example. I made sure they saw that because it's a fantastic movie. It's funny. It's a classic, and you can quote that thing all day long. So anyway, he was saying that. you know, people don't understand his movie quotes so much. So I don't want to think that everybody listening to the show understands what Festivus is. Festivus originated in the TV series Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld had a great thing going for a long time, making a show that was about absolutely nothing and making it hilarious each and every week. And it was Jerry and his friends, uh, George Costanza. There was uh, Kramer, who lived across the hall, and uh, what's a, Julia Louise Dreyfus? What was her character's name? Now, see, it's escaping me. Anyway, so this group of friends, they were always doing things together, and it was crazy and wacky and, and funny. That was the important part. It was funny each and every week. But the Costanza family, George Costanza, very high strung, always yelling, his mother and father always uh, yelling at one another, yelling at him, and it was George's dad that created Festivus. So I want to make sure you understand the whole concept here So here is Frank Costanza talking with Kramer and explaining the whole background of Festivus. Many Christmases ago, I went to buy a doll for my son. (laughs) I reached for the last one they had, but so did another man. As I rained blows upon him, I realized there had to be another way. What happened to the doll? It was destroyed. But out of that, a new holiday was born. A Festivus for the rest of us. That must have been some kind of doll. She was. <laughs> and at the Festivus dinner, you gather your family around and tell them all the ways they have disappointed you over the past year. And is there a tree? No, instead there's a pole. Requires no decoration. I find tinsel distracting. Frank, this new holiday of yours is scratching me right where I itch. Let's do it then. All right. Festivus is back! I'll get the pole out of the crawl space. So there you get the gist of it. That is what Festivus is all about. So earlier today, I prompted you, if you have any grievances, you could tweet them to me at Bobby Back Sports. So right now, let's get to it. The tradition of Festivus begins with the airing of grievances. I got a lot of problems with you people. Now, you're going to hear about it. The first grievance of the day comes from definitely not Putin. And here's his grievance. The trolls out there who say Torch is going to burn this team out makes no sense given things like stopping morning skates. I agree with that. And yesterday, uh, Ryan Mitchell did an interview with Mike Rupp that we had on the show. I also heard Mike Rupp a couple of days ago on a Pittsburgh radio station, and one of the things he said from when he played for Torch in New York is he said that uh, he treats every game like it's an NFL Sunday, and eventually that's going to burn guys out, just the intensity of every day. See, I don't get the impression that he is doing an NFL Sunday with every game that's going on. I, I think he's uh, keeping the focus on game to game, but I don't think he's building everything up like it's an NFL Sunday. So I agree with you on that. I it, I, I just think I think they are trolls, uh, In I guess for lack of a better term. I don't know what you used to call it. Now with social media, you call it trolls, but – uh, yeah, he's got to burn them out. You're right. He's uh, When it comes from the, the standpoint of the physical play, he is trying to give them as much rest as he possibly can just to make sure that they're not burned out. Kevin Green 
I don't think this is the Hall of Fame linebacker. Kevin says, no question, no complaint, no issue. Been waiting 16 years for this, just enjoying the ride and helping others onto the bandwagon. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. Uh, Keith Vanderbrook says, grievance, no need to chant Pittsburgh sucks during the game last night. Follow torts and treat it as a W and move on. Keith, I understand what you're saying, but I think you're being too nice. I really do. You don't have to treat that part of it like Torch does with the team. I mean, there are ways that the team approaches things, then there are ways that the fans approach things. And they are two different directions that you're going in here. For the fans of this team that have sat and watched their hometown team get beaten into submission by the Pittsburgh Penguins at Nationwide Arena before, why not? Let them say whatever they want. It's all fun. That's what creates rivalry stuff. And I know that Torts has said that it's not a rivalry with the Pittsburgh Penguins. You have to have a couple of playoff series between teams, but I don't know if that's entirely true. I don't even know if he totally believes that. But because there was a playoff series, it does amp it up. Because the cities are close in proximity, it does amp it up. I just think it's part of the fun of the whole thing. I mean, Don't worry about people's feelings. Don't worry about being nice. Just worry about winning. That's all. I, I don't care what goes on in the stands. I said last night, people kept throwing the, the hats over the glass behind Marc-Andre Fleury, and he would scrape them up and give them to the ice crew, and then somebody would wait till he got back into his goal crease and throw another one over there, and I thought it was funny. I, did, I said on the air last night, if I was down there, I wouldn't even tell people to stop it because you waited too long to have this opportunity. Maybe it's your only opportunity. Who knows? So enjoy it. Have fun. Live life. That's part of the deal with fans. You're allowed to do that stuff. Don't worry about being all, you know, prim and proper and uh, not offending anybody. I'm not saying that's what you're saying, but that's what it sounds like. Well, no need to chant Pittsburgh sucks. Eh, who cares? Who cares? Have a good time. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. You never know when that opportunity is going to come along again. Crunchy Granola has this grievance. The guy at the game last night who tried to emulate dancing Kevin. I thought Yarmo squashed all that nonsense. Move on. First of all, Yarmo, the last thing that Yarmo Kekalainen is worried about is a guy in the stands dancing, no matter who it is, okay? So he didn't squash anything. His job is to uh, get players to assemble a team. He's done a great job of that. So uh, don't, don't lump him into any conversation about what goes on with guys dancing with or without their shirts. But, um, again, this is – okay. All right, you didn't like it. I'll give you that. You didn't like it. Maybe somebody did. I don't know. Maybe somebody misses that. I have no idea. But, uh, uh, well, these are grievances. I, I'm getting what I asked for. You're right, so I'm not going to pick on you. These are your grievances. This is what you didn't like, so I can't say anything about it, whether I agree or disagree. Uh, Aaron Winland says, not a grievance, but I feel that the Montreal Canadiens not starting Carey Price tonight kind of feels like a lack of respect, even though Montoya is a pretty good goalie. Oh, now that's where we're going to get? Teams are disrespecting us. Oh, come on. Come on. For Al Montoya... This is an opportunity to make what went wrong right. I think that Michel Therrien is giving him a great chance to get back in net and show that that was a fluke the last time that he played in Columbus. And I'm sure that his team is going to respond the exact same way. They are going to be playing for him tonight because they don't want that to happen again. Not the 10 to nothing will happen again. They don't want to lose, and they don't want Montoya to lose. So why I would be doing – I am doing cartwheel. No, I can't do a cartwheel. I'm jumping for joy that Carey Price isn't starting. I mean, not that the Blue Jackets can't beat him. I firmly believe that they can beat him. I firmly believe they can beat anybody. But you're going into the Christmas break. You've won 11 in a row. You would like to go in there with 12 straight victories. If they want to put Al Montoya in, then God bless them. Let them put him in and see what happens. Uh, Gary Weinheimer has a very good grievance here. Kendrick Nicholson, who was a, one of the referees last night, calling Scott Hartnell for elbowing, which didn't happen. Didn't happen. Uh, two Penguins hit each other. It was a uh, it was a stick of one Penguins player that hit another Penguins player, and uh, it was Crosby, right? And anyway, uh, Hartnell, his elbow didn't even come up. It was a terrible call. It was awful. I've said before, and I'll say it again, that the officials get one look at things in real speed, but they blew that one. They absolutely blew it, and it's the second time in three games that that kind of stuff has happened to the Blue Jackets. You'll remember that Jack Johnson got called for a high stick in Vancouver, and it was one Vancouver player hitting another Vancouver player with a stick. It wasn't Jack Johnson's stick at all. So there's been talk about reviewing those calls, and I wish that they would talk about it more. Now, obviously, it's uh, fresh with me because it's just happened two times in three games. I don't know how often it happens throughout the course of the season. I think it happened in a Maple Leafs game the other day, though. 
So why not allow them to take a look at that? Because if it's wrong, then just take it back. It's not a big deal. The Blue Jackets had to kill off a penalty last night. Could you imagine what would have happened should the Pittsburgh Penguins had uh, scored on that power play that they should have never had in the first place? That could have changed the balance of the game. Okay? So I know that the referee gets one look at it. I understand that. But um, maybe you should give them the opportunity to take more than one look at it because it's obviously getting screwed up. It's obviously getting screwed up. Give them an opportunity to be right. They're trying to be right all the time. And there's a tremendous amount of pressure on those guys. Tremendous amount of pressure. They get all the grief from the players. They get all the grief from the coaches. Nobody ever tells them they do a good job. Maybe their supervisor does. But the supervisor also is just breaking down ad nauseum every part of their game. And here's another thing. Did you know that in the Situation Room in Toronto, when they're watching every single game that goes on every night, not only are they making uh, calls on goals or non-goals, they are also documenting what the officials are doing in that game. And there is a report after every game that goes to the supervisor of officials about every one of those referees and how they handled themselves, how they called the game. If there, if there's anything that stands out, you know, they're the supervisor is going to hear it. The guy that is the big cheese is going to find out about it because those reports get sent every night, and it is a it's a tough job. Number one, I have said this before. I don't know why anybody would want that for a career, because you just get ridden all the time, ridiculed, called names, everyone hates you. I, I don't know why anybody would want to have the job. But with that being said, uh, there is a ton of pressure, a ton of pressure. They make mistakes. They don't get credit for all the right calls that they make, and they get all the flack for all the bad calls that they make. But they should look at that. They should allow the officials to take a second look at calls like that one last night and make sure they got it right because they would have found out that it wasn't right and the Penguins never would have gotten a power play out of it. Ben says, Brad Shaw has been arguably the best acquisition this season. Do you expect that he will get looks as a head coach candidate? Um, no, I don't think so. He was an interim coach. I think it was interim for the New York Islanders years ago and has not been a head coach since. Look, I think he likes what he does. I think he likes – I know he likes where he is. He liked being in St. Louis for a long time. He wanted to come back to Ohio after being a head coach with the Cincinnati Mighty Ducks years ago. He wanted to be back in this area. He's back here. He's very good at what he does. You're right. He is extremely good at what he does. And this is no offense to Craig Hartsburg, who ran the defense the last couple of years. This is a much better defense. This is a much more talented group. I will give you that. But Brad has a connection – with this group that is very good, and I think that's why he is getting the most out of them. Matthew Bailey says, he's got no grievances, says keep doing an excellent job, and happy Festivus. Michael A., he's got a lot of stuff here. Michael says, can we give Brad Shaw the no-movement clause from David Clarkson's contract? <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> if you could Just imagine if you could switch those things or buy them and uh, give them to somebody else or something like that. Oh, what a business that would be. Michael also says, why not lock Gagne up for a few years now for perhaps pennies on the dollar? I talked about that uh, pretty extensively the other day. And, um, you know, I you know, waited out. Waited out for a while. And, you know, sometimes, and I'm not predicting anything. I have no inside info on this whole thing. But um, I, sometimes you get players like that, veteran players, and they get into a situation where, They've had success, and they might feel like they're at the end of their career, and all of a sudden they have some success, and they want to stay in that place. And they'll find a way to stay in that place and make it good for them and make it good for the organization. I don't know if it'll turn out that way, but I'm just saying that it very well could. Oh, here's another tweet from Matthew Bailey that I missed. It says, what is your go-to for a sore throat slash voice? Need to be ready again tonight. Here's my go-to, blackberry brandy. True story. My grandmother told me this years ago, uh, when it comes to kind of having a raspy voice and not being able to talk very well, blackberry brandy, and it works like a charm. In extreme occasions, you have to go further than that with whiskey and honey. I've only had to do that one time, not on the air. It was on a day off in between games when I had zero voice. True story, a couple of years ago. I had zero voice day before a game. By the time the game rolled around, I was good to go. Kelly has this question. After a big win last night, what can we expect for tonight's game? Well, Kelly, you never know until you get there. You never know until you see what's going to happen. You never know until you see what the Montreal Canadiens bring 
and what the Blue Jackets have left in the tank. But I can tell you this. The Blue Jackets are the home team. The Blue Jackets are the team that's on an 11-game winning streak. The Blue Jackets are the team that wants to go into the Christmas break on a high note, and that's what they not only intend to do, that's what they expect to do tonight. So I think you're going to see another good performance by the home team this evening, and uh, hopefully it's going to be good enough to get the win and go into that break with 12 straight wins. Now, I told you Montreal lost last night. They were at home. They lost to the Minnesota Wild. 4-2 to two was the final in that game. A couple of shorthanded goals, one each way, as a matter of fact. But Montreal, they have slipped a little bit. Uh, Alex Galchenyuk has been out, and that has certainly hurt them. But even though they've been slipping, they're still atop the Atlantic Division coming into play tonight. And they're still right there near the top of the league. By the way, who's at the top of the league? The Blue Jackets, don't forget that. But uh, Montreal has a record of 21-8-4. and four. That's good for 46 points. That has them three ahead of Ottawa and a full seven points ahead of the Boston Bruins. And with 46 points or two behind the Blue Jackets, who lead the league with 48 points tied with the Chicago Blackhawks, but they win the tiebreaker by virtue of the head-to-head beating of Chicago earlier in the season. Now, it's only 31 games in. It's too early to be talking about playoffs and President's Trophy and all that jazz. I understand. But for this one day, can we just enjoy it? Can we have a great Festivus enjoying being on top of the National Hockey League for the day? I think we can. The other games that are being played tonight, and there are uh, a lot of them, and you know, if the Blue Jackets stub their toe tonight, they could lose that first place uh, spot in the Metropolitan Division by the end of the night. Bruins are in Carolina to play the Hurricanes tonight. The Flames host the Canucks. The Avalanche is in Chicago. The Kings are in Dallas tonight. The Florida Panthers host the Red Wings. The Oilers are in San Jose. Uh, the New York Rangers are hosting the Minnesota Wild, the Red Hot Wild. That'll be an interesting game. The Penguins are back at home tonight. They take on the Devils. And the Islanders are going to play the Sabres. Capitals are at home taking on the Tampa Bay Lightning. That should be a good one this evening. The Toronto Maple Leafs are in Arizona. Austin Matthews, the Scottsdale, Arizona kid, and last year's number one overall pick is returning to his home area to take on his hometown team, the Arizona Coyotes. So that's going to be uh, an interesting one tonight. Good storylines on that one. In the meantime, it's the Blue Jackets getting set to take on the Montreal Canadiens. The Canadiens are looking for revenge after being blasted to the tune of 10 to nothing the last time they were here at Nationwide Arena. The Blue Jackets, as I said, trying to make it 12 straight wins and stay atop the Metropolitan Division, the Eastern Conference, and the NHL. 7 o'clock face-off tonight. I'll have all the action starting at 6.45 with pregame coverage on the flagship station of the Blue Jackets Radio Network, 97.1 The Fan in Columbus, also across the radio network throughout Ohio, and you can get the game on the NHL app or the Blue Jackets channel on the TuneIn app. It's going to be great, and it's the last game before Christmas, so take care, have a Merry Christmas, and until later tonight, this is Bob McElligot saying so long. <laughs>